today's guest is Sasha Dents. She's one of these people that you meet from time to time who have such a broad range of knowledge and a huge heart. And they're able to integrate several different topics and themes into our current situation of how we're living today, what the problems and challenges are, and what the solutions can be. So there's no way to really describe the conversation you're about to watch other than please just watch it and enjoy. Thank you for coming. Really appreciate it. And um, in our little warm-up we just did, you talked mm -hmm. about um, if you focus just on the environmental challenges that we have, we might be mm -hmm. missing the point that there's something underneath that that's probably more important. Can we start there? Yeah. I think that it's very short-sighted and um, failing to understand the extent and degree of the crisis we're in. That the crisis we're in actually started about 500 years ago um, in a period that's called, some people call it, historians call it the pre-modern period. But actually it sort of began at that time. And, and if you don't understand that, if you don't understand what happened at that point, then everything you do is going to be kind of patchwork. It's going to be Band-Aid solutions. Um, but there's also a very powerful um, will not to understand it, not to know, not to know why we are the way we are. And also part of that problem is we don't know what we are. Like, we don't know how um, mentally ill or um, dysfunctional or potentially just sick our society is, and we as individuals are. So what began back then? Well... <laughs> Everybody knows their basic history. Um, probably the modern era began or in the in the 15th century. Um, that was the time when Columbus discovered the New World, when shipbuilding and and navigation skills were were sophisticated enough to get ships to places they had never been before, couldn't go before. There was that. There was also um, the emerging of the modern state with uh, the breakdown of Christendom. And Christendom, the, probably the last council they had, the Council of Basel, was in 1449. So you can kind of date that that was the last time when all of the bishops and all of the um, people who were involved in Christendom, the Christendom Project, which started 800 years before that, um, got together and said, what do we do? Which they had been doing yearly. And they never did it again after that. And so it was also a time of when the printing press was invented. So with that invention and, and um, the emerging of, of states, nation states, a whole bunch of things, and mercantilism, a whole bunch of things came together. But the thing that basically happened that's important to understand is what C.S. Lewis talks about. He said, in the pre-modern world, the task of being human, or the, or the main problem of being human, and the main understanding of being human was to adjust yourself from childhood on to reality. To make yourself disciplined, virtuous, which required enormous self-control, and to get enough knowledge and education, but not just of the head, but of what they would call the soul and the heart. Mm -hmm. And that was the project, to make yourself able to deal with reality, you know, and see, reality is the thing you adjust it to. What shifted at that time, is around the 16th century, was when people started to have inventions and discoveries and technology, they said, and it probably wasn't conscious or deliberate, but they said, why? Why can't I be, which is a dream that goes way back to Gilgamesh, why can't I use these new powers, really, in the service of myself? So what that project then became was how to adapt reality to us. How to change the natural world in particular, because, you know, up until then, nature had been the authority figure. Like, nature had been the one that says, look, this is what you do. Hmm. Hunger is a pretty powerful motivator for your behavior. Yep. And um, there was, I think, a deep resentment in human beings against nature. You don't like it. And against the transcendent, the lawgiver. 
Mm-hmm. So both those, sorry, just uh, just let me finish this part. Both those things had held ultimate authority before. They were reality. The transcendent God who gave moral strictures said, you cannot behave any way you want. There's a, there's a, it's written in stone, the Ten Commandments. Um, it's not something you can change arbitrarily at your will. Similarly, nature had authority. The ground was your boss. Mm-hmm. It told you how to behave. And your own biology mm-hmm. Also, you know, you couldn't do anything about it. It just was the way it was. Mm-hmm. So that all changed by the 15th century. There became the possibility, you no, know, we can change everything. Mm-hmm. And one of the things we've got to do is get rid of the authority there, down, and get rid of the authority there. And we can't do it immediately. We can't do it overnight because then people will go, oh, my God. Mm-hmm. This is terrible. This could go somewhere awful. Yeah. Right? And then we re- they would not let me do that. But Francis Bacon and Hume and Locke and um, Descartes, I mean, a bunch of people were writing and saying, um, they were all professed, still professed Christians because it was the water they swam in. But none of what they wrote referenced any transcendent authority. They subtly and in very, which is the scientific method is, Descartes articulated it. I see this. I observe this. I am the authority. Yeah, positivism in science yes. and validation exercise through sharing results, and you can replicate my results. Therefore, it's true. Um, might be mathematically true. And it's human-centered. True. Yeah, but it might not be spiritually true or connected to a universe true. You speak from a, um, a position so far on a, on a, how it's um, white. Um, religious-based, European-based. I'm curious, yes. do you have a similar or parallel narrative from the European expansion model and distancing from the self uh-huh. because of mechanization and modernization, uh, the role that money had to play in society? What about um, Turtle Island and First Nations long before um, um, Columbus and the rest came over here or the Norse came over before Columbus? Or do you have a... a Asian version of the same narrative? In China or, or Asia or yeah. Africa? Do, do they have equivalent stories? Because we tend to, as white people, speak from a certain history. Yes, that's what I, we, were, I we were taught. Yeah. So on a global scale, because um, environmental challenges will be global in scale, do those other geographic regions or philosophical regions or religious regions have their own narrative and and caught up almost in the same distancing from the self and from nature good question i i don't i can't say i'm i know chinese or asian or african history as well as i probably should but what i do know is no they did not introduce the machine age they did not have a, a sort of philosophical um and it was sort of it. It may have been indigenous to Western thought. I mean, it's classical and you know and Christian, but um, the why we need to focus on the Western model in a way is because through globalization, it's become the human model. Yeah, it's dominated the narrative globally. Yes. And and it has for a reason. I mean, what it did was say, look, uh, nature, your body, uh, God. These things have controlled your life. You've had to obey. You've had to be submissive. You've had to be willing to adapt and change yourself in order to fit. Now we're saying through technology, through thinking this way, uh, through all the things we can do, and boy, we can do a lot, just keep this optimism. was so. And everybody's had the human condition. Everybody's going, yeah. And not just for selfish reasons. You can say, well, you know, I can cure my wife or my son or my thing, or or I can do in agriculture what I couldn't do before, or I can manuf- through manufacturing, I can, mm. everybody can have a house, everybody can have clothes, everybody can. So there seems to be, um, especially with good ideas being mixed in with this uh, proclamation, um, something so, so incredibly seductive. And everybody gets on board. I mean, you know, already we have, the American dream has been outsourced and exported to the rest of the world, So, every, and everybody's got a screen of some description. It yep. doesn't matter how poor you are. My sister went to Kenya, and she went into what was called the middle class, 
which meant you sometimes had water, you sometimes had electricity. The water was never warm. That it was never the anyway. You know, yep. the, the drill. Yes, <laughs> but she said everybody had a screen, yeah. and they were always looking at our life. And they said, you know, what do I have to do? What do I have to change in order to be like them? And then you come here and you go, well, yeah, <laughs> right. Technology and <laughs> why, why do you want to be it's like been us? So, yeah, exactly. It's just so wonderful here, yeah. and that was the thing that they didn't understand. They didn't understand that even if you got rid of disease, even if you got rid of hardship, even if you got rid of some of the the things that really did press upon you, um, oppress you, that you wouldn't necessarily be happy. Hmm. But happiness is everybody's goal. Mm-hmm whether we admit it or not. <laughs> and so it's global. Yes. yes. Everybody's got on board for the Western project yep. in one description or another, yep. either has or wants to. And that ties us back to your beginning about the environmental challenges we have yep. that are connected to that gap that has a long history of how we've come to be in this place in this moment in time. Yes, exactly. So do you have some solutions or thoughts on directions, paths for where we can go? Is it is it reduction of capitalism and its impact on our society? Is it a different type of politics in our world that's not built on power as opposed to built on community? There's this lovely book called uh, The Book of Joy with um, Desmond Tutu and Dalai Lama. And their direction that they offer is happiness and community. Happiness and, and community. Yes. So yes. those are both invitations to like an energy plane as opposed to a mechanical, capitalistic, uh, generate wealth plane. Well, yes, I do have um, ideas. I don't have a solution. Um, the solution will initially be extremely painful for most of us. Um, and so, you know, you've got to be hesitant in offering it. Um, I'm, a, I'm a housewife. I'm just... I just look after kids and the home and my husband and sort of vaguely myself and this dog that's really, really annoying. <laughs> oh, if I'd known, <laughs> sold a bill of goods on that one. <laughs> no, I really love her, sort of, kind of. Anyhow, um, what I realized and seeing with my kids coming in all the time is that, yes, there's a whole bunch of movements. I mean, you can look at Capitalism, you can look at the Industrial Revolution, possibly, potentially, the worst thing that ever happened to us as a planet. The wound, the end all wounds. And the whole notion of revolution is, you know, embedded now in the, in the Western psyche. If you look at how we think and, and how we observe things, we say, revolution always needs a bad guy. Yeah. Right? Well, always it always needs to say, yes, it always says, we are right. We're the enlightened ones, and, and those over there, and we just have to, because we can't enlighten them fast enough, which we can't, yeah. we have to force a coup and change them. But power over is exactly what that modern entity wants us to be thinking in terms of, because it is power. I mean, C.S. Lewis talked about it as magic. He said, just as the old idea of magic was sort of waning, we got this new idea of magic, and it, it, we treat it as though it was magic. I mean, Christopher Marlowe in... Uh, God, I'll get to your questions. I promise I haven't forgotten. It's okay. Christopher Marlowe in Dr. Faustus. Uh, Dr. Faustus is seen as a modern uh, academic. He's, he's got all of these degrees. He's a scientist. He's a chemist. He's a, a botanist. He's, a, you know, he's got all of this wealth of knowledge. His IQ is off the scale. Hmm. Um, but it, isn't, it doesn't give him what he wants. It doesn't give him enough power. So that's when he makes this deal with the devil. And the, the, the play is so interesting because he does it as a modern man. Hmm. He said, I, I don't believe in you. Like, I know there's no such thing as the devil and hell and God and all that superstitious nonsense. At the same time, maybe I can use you. So Mephistopheles comes and says, whatever you want, so long as you sign right here. And uh, so he says, well, if I sign right there, you're going to give me what I want? He said, you've got 24 years, which if he was really, really bright, he would have seen as being like 24 hours, a temporary little piece of time before you can spend all of this time in agony. But of course, he justifies it by saying, this isn't real, but this is real. So anyhow, 
Christopher Marlowe said, we, we understood all of this knowledge and this ability as power. And when we think of it in terms of politics or we think of it in terms of um, uh, legislation or mm -hmm. doing things, I'm not saying those things are ineffective. I'm just saying that you can't change people's minds. Yeah. And it's very, and you antagonize a lot of other people. Yep. So, sorry. No, but to support that, because we're hedging into where does change come from. Um, Donella yes. Meadows, Donella Meadows does a lovely piece, maybe 15 years ago now, about, um, it's not tipping points in a system, but it's along that mindset. It's not Gladwell's stuff. Um, and she points out nine key indicators where change can come from. The weakest of which, or number nine, is numbers. So anybody using numbers to justify a change will be picking the, the weakest leverage point. So anytime you get pollsters telling you stats, anytime you get mm -hmm. sociologists doing demographic studies, they won't be indicators of change. They'll be indicators of something that came in the past or has happened and doesn't set you up for future shift. Mm -hmm. There's In the middle, there's positive feedback loops, negative feedback loops. So your taxes, people treat as a negative feedback loop. Positive feedback loop would be a reinforcement for a good behavior. Number one is heart. So it shifts to an emotional plane pretty quickly. And everything you're mapping out kind of wants to lead us to a happiness, community, um, revolution. But revolution doesn't necessarily need a boogeyman to go fight against. Paulo Freire in uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed talks about, um, in, I'll say it incorrectly, hegemony or hegemony? I'm sorry? Hegemony? Hegemony. Hegemony, yeah. thank you. Um, he'll talk about how the oppressors, um, be, uh, how the oppressed become the oppressors. Yes. So nothing Always. really changed, they just flip systems. Always. So it might be that in this window of time, this 20 year window from 2012 to roughly 2032, 20, there's a shift that's occurred and there's more and more exposure of corruption, more and more lack of tolerance in a population. They're more connected to each other. One of the benefits of social media change. So is it possible that the information age, which has kicked in now in full maturity compared to the mechanization age, industrial age, are there seeds planted there if we can find our heart again? Yes, to, but you know, to, to be honest, on one hand, the global community that's formed through the internet is great. It's you know, and especially you know the the social movements you can feel like you're a part of just by pushing a button. Hmm. That's fantastic. However, it's not real. Hmm. And I guess to tell the truth, what I think will make change is how we treat our children. Hmm. That we take their emotional needs a lot more seriously than we do. We uh, prioritize education, and we prioritize professional success. And uh, from the cradle, we now do that for women too. So uh, we leave children for like eight or nine hours a day. And then in the remaining part of the day, say, well, we'll get our quality time in, um, and they'll somehow still be attached to us. They'll, be, they'll see us as the source of love and comfort. And, and um, having seen my my kids bring in all kinds of other kids, and even when the the families are sort of working, they're not working. There's an incredible amount of misery in us who have achieved the American dream, family breakdown. But the kids are in very very bad shape. Having you know taught for twenty years, I can say that a number of students and essays because I get es I got essays right, and what they were saying was. These are educated, well-fed, nutrition. Um, they have their vaccines. They've got mm -hmm. they. <clears throat> everything is is great. They are athletic. They know they have to exercise, and they're morally feral. They have no idea what uh, if I have to do the right thing. Hmm. Plato said, "To know the good is to do the good." What if you know the good and then find out in that moment, hey, I can't do the good. I don't have the moral muscle. I haven't developed the virtue hmm. to be able to do that. See, in the pre-modern world, the idea was a completely different understanding of being a human being. You, you uh, were born, and then, you, as I said, you adapted to reality. But the point was, 
You saw yourself as a biological part and a spiritual part, and the two come together to, to make this hybrid mongrel species. Um, but this was supposed to help this. By the biological thing, by disciplining the spiritual part of it, was to learn how to love in a way, um, through limits, through incredible limits, learn how to li love without limits. And thank you for watching. Be good, have fun, and love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon.